Thank you very much, Penny, and thanks for the invitation to come and give a talk here today about something that was touched on this morning by our first speaker about translational plant science. And actually, one of the things that I was really wanting to do in this very first slide was to reinforce this view that it's incredibly important that we maintain this, the basic research on which everything else hinges, and that we don't become derailed in the next few years when money is very tight to drive a lot of our investment in the research councils along this pipeline. What I'm going to propose instead is that organisations like FERA, the research institutes, and other organisations within government and in the private sector can help academics take their ideas and push them along the pipeline, which is all what our translation research is about, translating the benefits of your basic research into applied outputs to ultimately go to uh, consumption and end users. What I was going to do today was, was, was talking about one really big challenge uh, in translational plant science, uh, which is around closing the yield gap. Uh, and what I was going to do then was talk about what FERA contributes to this area and what it can do in partnership with universities and others in terms of addressing big translational problems but using the best quality uh, research available. So I was going to talk a little bit about one aspect of the yield gap which we know is important, crop protection. And I was going to talk in really about three areas that FERA is active in this area, one about pesticide safety and stewardship, uh, another in diagnostics and crop protection and leading on from that, how we can use that sort of information to uh, manage disease at, at farm scale, in fact, at uh, countrywide scale. And then finally, just give you one example, a very brief example of how we're already working with universities uh, to develop products which are based on basic science and taking them through to applied uh, solutions. So since the mid-1990s, what, what we've seen is a, is a tailing off of a plateauing of many uh, of the productivities and yields of most of our major crops. And we know that can't be entirely right because the genetics tell us that, in fact, yields should continue to be uh, on the rise. Uh, and it's this shortfall in, in not just theoretical yield, but what can be achieved under best, uh, under best practice at test sites. And what's actually achieved on farm is what we call the yield gap. The reasons for it are multifactorial and they, they're increasingly complex, uh, but they cannot be improved, uh, cannot be uh, addressed solely by improving genetics. They have to be addressed by a whole raft of different sciences and very much around the idea of utilising translational approaches to close this yield gap. So this just illustrates, this is some information from DEFRA. Uh, here on land area, this is for uh, winter wheat. We can see that as the land area available for wheat production has tailed off. There was a, an increase in yield for a few years. But then since the mid-1990s, these yield plateaus have, have pretty much uh, been entrenched for year on year. To give you some idea, we had some figures yesterday. 14 tonnes per hectare uh, is quite achievable, albeit rarely, but achievable on farm. And typically we're achieving at the moment about 8 tonnes per hectare across the country. So if we were able to close that yield gap, we would, we would really be pushing the agenda on sustainable intensification. The important thing here is we don't beat ourselves up too much uh, about being in the UK and wheat. This is not uh, unique to wheat. It's happening with many of our major crops. And not only is it happening to many of our major crops, it's geographically not located to any one particular area. There are lots of parts of the world where these yield gaps are emerging. And so understanding the yield gap in the UK is not just something we're doing to help ourselves in terms of our own productivity. It's a global issue and one that we can use to address global problems and sustainable intensification in agriculture. Now, the reasons for uh, the yield gap have been analysed for a number of different crops, but this is one of the more comprehensive. Uh, this is actually uh, an analysis of maize yield gap uh, in different parts of the world, in different um, growing domains. And these are typically the sorts of reasons that have been established as the causative agents for the yield gap. One, around knowledge systems. This means effectively the, the, uh, the uses of the best information and the best systems available. Uh, second, mechanisation. Third, pests, weeds and diseases. Then nutrients and water. And what we can see is that in different parts of the world, each of those different components plays a different part in contributing to the yield gap. Now, if we break down that yield gap into a little bit more detail, we can effectively see what's theoretically possible and what's actually practically possible under the best circumstances, say, on experimental station or on plant breeding stations. And we can see it's this gap at the top which is, is addressable, by, particularly by plant genetics. Uh, what we then see is a fall between experimental station yield and what's 
really potentially uh, achievable on farm. And here we see that the gap can largely be closed by the application of non-genetic technologies, but ones which are indeed technologically based, for example, better application of precision agriculture, uh, new crop protection technologies, improved engineering, irrigation, nutrition, etc. And then we see something a little bit more perturbing, which is the, the lack of uh, yield that we see between potential farm and actual farm, and that's no normally around failure to adopt best practice. That's all about um, advisory services, uh, not being uh, an advice, not being adopted properly. So there are three major causes of agents, some of which, two of which are addressable by technology, and one which is much more to do with social research. So what we're trying to do, um, and this is something that's part of a, a, a national initiative that's being undertaken at the moment, you'll hear a lot more about it in the next couple of months, it's called the Agri-Technology Strat Strategy, it's being led by um, BIS and by DEFRA, uh, but it's also heavily involving industry, and of course BBSRC are very much to the fore in it. And the idea here is that uh, we need to be able to take the knowledge that's produced at the very beginning of the pipeline, the stuff that you guys are doing in the universities, and taking it through to the end users. And so we're here, we're all about really reconstructing what we heard had been broken back in the 80s, this pipeline from people creating knowledge to the people able to utilize that in terms of in increasing food production. So what's the role of organizations like FERA? Uh, FERA is a government agency. We are actually a government agency that's part of, the, of, of DEFRA. Uh, and you've, you're very familiar, of course, with the John Ennis Centre and with uh, Rothamsted. But FERA is also a contributor to uh, translational plant science, but one that sits a little bit closer to the end user. And so if you think about these pipelines from the universities all the way through to end use in industry, FERA potentially has a major contributive role to take stuff through uh, to final fruition. So in terms of what FERA does in terms of its science, it takes basic science from our partners in universities and institutes, and it applies them for real-life applications out in the field. And we do it for two major reasons, one of which we, we're carrying out research work to support evidence which informs policy. And that's very important, of course, for all of us in terms of policy around what government departments decide because that affects our day-to-day -day lives. And also we're involved in dealing with things when they go wrong. That's really what agency science is about, dealing with emergencies, mitigating risk, and also uh, dealing with uh, outbreaks of disease uh, and infestations from uh, foreign pests. So basically what we're doing here, we're carrying out science or research to support response functions in terms of responding to emergencies and to provide evidence to inform policy and also to provide research tools for people who go out and do the regulatory work for inspectorates. Uh, we are organized into three major science programs, plant protection, food safety, and environmental science. And the stuff that's impacting on uh, this particular conference here today will really pull, uh, pull on the uh, work of plant protection and environmental sciences in particular. So just to illustrate what organizations like FARA do, and in fact this is quite a similar kind of a wheel of science that you would also see with the other interagency uh, organizations is the response to threats. And we're seeing an enormous number of threats entering the UK and Europe uh, pretty much on a monthly basis these days, both in the environmental sector and in the food uh, sector. Increasingly, we're utilizing technologies that allow us to see things for the first time, things that we weren't expecting to find. We're not looking for specifics very often now. We're looking for things that hadn't previously been described. We identify them, we perform a risk assessment, we tell government, hey, you should be doing something about this, you should be closing down imports of these particular products, for example. But we quickly get onto the science, and this is stuff that we're doing not just on our own, but here we're putting in the university sectors, uh, we're putting in SMEs and other companies to help us design widgets, kits, uh, and other tools that allow us to be able to develop diagnostics and solutions. The idea here is originally we identify things in the lab, and we want to pull that technology out into the field, and we want to do that as quickly as possible. When we take that diagnostics out into the field, we need to know it works. So this is a very important part of diagnostics technology. You need to get it right when you de design a diagnostics platform. So you validate it. Uh, then you can give it out to the people who actually go out there and do the work. And some of these guys are not scientifically trained, so you have to be coming up with uh, solutions and diagnostic technologies that can be used by non-specialists. That allows, allows them to do their job, and then you can go back, hopefully, to surveillance. You're going back to your routine surveillance and waiting for your next threat. And we've seen in the last few months several uh, emerge, both in the food sector, like the horse meat and the butte uh, scandal, and also, of course, emergent diseases like cholera, fraxinia, 
and several invasive insect pests like Asian longhorn beetle. So, uh, what I'd like to do now is really focus on ferrous science and what it's doing in terms of crop protection and how that impacts on uh, the yield gap. Well, we already know that the, some of the yield gap, an important component of the yield gap, is caused by loss to pests, pathogens, and competing weeds. Importantly, this is not a static uh, scenario. We're seeing climate change driving new pests, new pathogens into the UK, and uh, this is causing us potentially large losses in the future. Uh, we're also seeing the potential changes in usage of agrochemicals driven by safety concerns which are uh, underpinned by EU directives, in particular endocrine disruption uh, of many chemicals is causing the premature withdrawal of several chemicals from the environment which are having major effects, uh, as I'll describe in the moment, on, on agricultural production. We're also seeing something uh, which is uh, very worrying in terms of resistance to crop protection agents, which is emerging in several major pat fungal pathogens, in insect pests and weeds. So the, the chemical arsenal that we have to control these things is becoming increasingly uh, limited, and we've got fewer and fewer chemicals to draw on to do that uh, protection work. Uh, and importantly, we're also seeing a decline in innovation. A decline in innovation, what I mean here, is not the fact the ideas aren't coming through. We're seeing a lack of products that are coming through to market from the agrochemical sector in terms of coming up with new solutions for crop protection. So just to go through some of those in a little bit more detail, what we've seen steadily since the mid-1980s all the way through today is a move away from uh, risk-based assessments of chemical usage to hazard-based assessments. That's to say, if a chemical has a known activity, as an endocrine disrupting uh, uh, potential activity, then we have to consider that that's going to work its way in the environment, and that helps in some ways to drive that chemical out of the market. In some cases, uh, we're then seeing major effects on the horticultural and agricultural industries. Uh, in particular, horticulture has suffered pretty badly over the last few years on the withdrawal of agrochemicals, but we're now seeing potentially inroads into our crop protection agents used on large-scale arable agriculture as well. In terms of resistance, these are just four of the major pathogens of cereals we find here in the UK, and increasingly we're finding resistance uh, stacking up in these different fungal pathogens to the extent where we're now seeing challenge to most of our major chemical classes. So this is something that's coming up very quickly, and it, again, combined with the number of com compounds available to us increasingly being uh, more restricted due to the EU directives, this is a major challenge now for the future. In terms of, uh, we heard a little bit about blackgrass earlier on. This is actually a massive problem for UK arable agriculture. About 1.2 million hectares of land are infested with herbicide-resistant blackgrass. And since 1982, we've seen types of black grass emerging which are now resistant to all classes of herbicide. So this is a very major challenge to uh, sustainable wheat production and indeed other crops. You can see typically 20% yield losses in, in uh, fields infested with herbicide-resistant black grass. And then finally, there's this point around the, the costs of developing new agrochemical agents. Increasingly, we're seeing actually the cost of some of the biology uh, and the chemistry have not changed markedly over the last uh, 20 years, but what we have seen are massive increases in the cost of bringing these compounds into the market with respect to registration studies, environmental safety, toxicological profiles. And so as there's been increasing concerns about the effects of these compounds on the environment, they have made these compounds increasingly difficult to develop in terms of cost. So what I'd like to do now is talk about ferrotranslational science, start off with pesticide safety and stewardship, uh, and the reason I think this is very important is there is no sign that we're going to be uh, met with large numbers of new actives coming onto the market over the next few years, and that means we have to make best use of the compounds we already have. I'm then going to talk a little bit about what Ferro is probably best known for, its in-field diagnostics and how we're increasingly utilising that for precision agriculture, uh, and ulti ultimately some of the large-scale disease, uh, disease management programmes we have ongoing at Ferro and some of the impacts that can have in terms of working with the genetics to make best use, again, of the resources that we have available. And finally, an example of where we're working with a university to develop a new class of pesticide. So first of all, something highly topical, the neonicotinoid story. Uh, you've probably heard a lot about this in the news, on the television. And basically, uh, these are an important class of insecticides, one of the few classes that's been developed in the last few years. They're systemic compounds, so they're largely applied on in, in the seed at the time of uh, planting. The chemical then works its way through the, the tissues of the plant and in, in, importantly will give protection to that plant pretty much through its entire life. 
It's used, they're used extensively across Europe to protect our major crops, where we have insect infestation problems. They can save up to 40% yield, and they're worth a lot of money across the European Union, about 4.5 billion euros. Um, importantly, and one thing that hasn't come across very clearly in the debates around this at the moment, is if we withdraw neonicotinoid insecticides, which are applied onto the seed, we go back to former applies, uh, applications of insecticides which are based around spray trials, uh, spray, um, uh, spray application. And that include a whole range of unpleasant compounds like the organophosphates, carbamates, and to a lesser extent the pyrethroids. So there's been severe concern about the effects of neonicotinoid insecticides on pollinators, particularly on bees, and this has led to the banning of these compounds in several countries, uh, and EFSA currently are carrying out a, uh, a, a report to, to, to recommend whether or not they should be continued to use in other European countries as well. And this has been largely affected by a number of high-profile papers and reports. So what we've been doing at Faro, of course, we take this very seriously. We work with both the private sector and uh, indeed with DEFRA and CRD, looking at neonicotinoids and their impacts on bees. But we have to stand back and think that there are lots of other challenges to bees going on there. And we have at Ferra the National Bee Unit, so the biggest collection of research beehives and bee scientists in the UK. And they're taking a holistic view of the things that are challenging bees at the moment. And, and neonicotinoids are just one of the problems they face. They're faced with parasites uh, like Varroa. They're then facing the viruses which Varroa bring with it and a whole host of other diseases, foul brood. Uh, and also uh, a whole range of fungal and bacterial pathogens. Uh, and they're also suffering in some instance, instances from mal malnutrition in terms of the way that we're managing the environment and the limited range of pollens that these things are able to eat. So at the moment, what we're trying to do is just put a break on this wholesale ditching of a very important class of chemicals so we can get, take a really objective view of what's going on here. And our view today is, although there are problems with some of these insecticide classes, on the whole, and certainly with the, most of the compounds that are being used out there in the field at the moment, these are not problems that are causing large-scale uh, bee collapse and certainly not, can not be accounted uh, on their own for the large numbers uh, of bee decline that have been claimed in a number of pieces of work. So I'd now like to move on to diagnostics at Ferra. This is something that's been established um, right from the very beginnings of the organisation, which stretch almost back to 100 years now. Uh, and the diagnostics has largely been based around supporting our inspectorate functions. And the inspectorate functions are trying to keep diseases out of the country. Uh, and they're trying to keep them out of the country, both in plant imports and also, in fact, in bee imports. Uh, what we try to use here is a combination of tools which we can deploy out in the field to give us a first heads up as to whether or not we then need to pass samples down the line for more detailed lab diagnostics back at the Sand Hutton uh, site at York. Uh, and at Sand Hutton, we have, in addition to high throughput diagnostics technologies, which I'll describe in just a moment, a raft of people you very rarely find out there in, uh, in, in the scientific um, environment anymore, people like parataxonomists, pathologists, entomologists, so they're there in quite large numbers. Uh, we are also able to carry out pest modelling uh, and prediction uh, uh, based on our long-term data sets and also our, our pest risk analysis. So in terms of uh, detection of pathogens, of course, if you've got skilled pathologists and entomologists, they can often identify things out in the field straight away, but there are a very small number of those individuals, and of course, they're a very rare resource. So instead, we've increasingly turned to diagnostics that can be used by people with a minimal amount of training. This is one, this is a lateral flow device. So this is an antibody-based detection system, very similar to pregnancy testing kits. The sample's applied here in the well, and it then migrates along the membrane, and it meets up with a series of antibodies, which will then give, based on the positive or negative reactions, the user a very strong indication of whether there's a pathogen or a pest present. Increasingly, we've been moving to DNA diagnostics, and this has taken advantage of technology that was originally worked for the uh, American government uh, out in the field for the military, and this is to take, basically, PCR equipment out into the field to carry out PCR reactions on site, but increasingly we're now moving away from a polymerase chain reaction to isothermal uh, amplification. The reason for this isothermal amplification taking over is that the, the actual equipment's much smaller and technically easier to use. Uh, and these assays mean that we can now detect for specific pieces of DNA associated with pests and pathogens in the course of minutes, and we can multiplex these assays uh, running several at a time. Uh, we've also got support back at Ferra uh, in terms of our ability to look at an untargeted 
threats utilising a whole range of technologies including virus sequencing and metabolomics. So what we're trying to do here is we work with the university sector to help us to develop, for example, new biomarkers which we can then utilise to detect new threats as they enter the food and environment chains. So just a little bit here, we heard uh, again some discussion yesterday on cholera fraxinia, ash dieback. Uh, this is the sort of symptomology you find in ash trees that are affected by cholera. We were very heavily involved in the uh, diagnostic side of this. And actually one of the really good things I think that came out of that was the rapid collaboration that Ferrum was able to establish with workers at the Sainsbury Lab and down with, at Exeter University in terms of moving quickly into the genomics of cholera fraxinia, uh, which had been hitherto not been attempted by the uh, other uh, disease control uh, agencies across Europe. So this is a disease that's been working its way steadily across Europe in the 1990s and turned up uh, for sure in the UK in 2012. We now think it probably arrived a little bit before then. Uh, and basically from its first detection in February 2012, we then instigated a whole raft of very rapid steps in terms of being able to then get into routine diagnostics. And in fact the critical bit here, which is where we took a method that had previously been worked up for PCR and took it through to a method that could be deployed out in the field utilising isothermal amplification just took two weeks. So this is one of the benefits of having something like an agency all sat under one roof. You can respond to emergencies very rapidly. And that meant that we were able to pass this technology out to people who'd hitherto had very little experience of using isothermal amplification and equipment out into the field for a diagnosis across the country. So this just runs through the steps in terms of um, the speed with which this has worked up. So here we've worked over up into two weeks, an assay which can, in 30 minutes, run 14 samples and definitively tell you whether or not you've got a diseased ash tree or not, even though there are no symptoms shown. So in terms of uh, moving on to arable agriculture, uh, Farah has also been involved in surveying disease. It's been surveying disease in a big way since the 1970s, typically with our major arable crops. Um, we're interested here in not just surveying it, but understanding what the major drivers of it are, uh, and then we can move on to disease prediction and indeed formulating control strategies. So this is work originally that was started off largely funded by government, but again another important piece of translational science here is that increasingly we're looking for solutions in the translational science space that, that involve both private and public sector. So Crop Monitor, which is a program where we're looking at uh, disease incidents across the UK in different test plots, is a project that's run and funded by the Homegrown Cereals Authority and partly funded by Bayer Crop Science. So this is a very important big, big program, long-term program, funded both by public and private sectors. So taking on those kind of uh, screening activities, we can then start to see incidences of diseases. And of course, they're dependent on the crop and they're also dependent on things like environment. And we can then start to unravel what are the major factors that are driving disease. Is it, for example, climatic conditions? Is it the genetic, genetic background of the plants that are being put, put into the ground? Or is it indeed things like agronomic practice when plants are being uh, harvested, sorry, not harvested, but originally sown? And so we can start to get to piece together a, a picture of where we're seeing um, disease incidents linked to different practice. And once we start to understand that, we can start to do something about it. So this is a program, again, which is involved between Ferrer and the John Innes Centre, where we're trying to match fungicide use best onto the genetic background of different plants, uh, of different varieties of wheat. So different varieties of wheat have intrinsically different resistances to fusarium. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is minimise the uh, application of fungicides to match that genetic background. So finally, I'd just like to run through a brief example of where we're working with a university. Uh, this is where we've been doing some work over many years with Durham and Newcastle universities trying to develop a novel biopesticide. Uh, and this is a pesticide that's based on, on a protein, based on a, an insect venom. Uh, and it's, the idea here is to take something that was originally developed in the lab as a concept through to something that could be used out in the field to control not only insects but also slugs as well. The idea here is basically it's an insect protein venom produced by spiders. Uh, this in itself, if you spray it onto insects, is not particularly effective because it's degraded too readily in the environment and is, it is very poorly delivered into the insect. So uh, Gatehouse uh, and colleagues have worked up a, a delivery method based on tagging it to a fusion protein which enables it to cross the uh, insect gut epithelium for effective delivery. And what we've been involved in at Ferro is working this now up into a whole set of different technologies and um, application methods 
that can allow it to be used out in the field for the protection of plants. So now this has gone to the stage where we've got industrial scale production of the biopesticide and we're now entering pre-registration <coughs> studies. So this is another example where based on uh, public need for things like new molluscicides to replace metaldehyde, this is very much a public-led uh, enterprise in terms of uh, taking a product through to market. So finally, um, I'd just like to identify what FERRA can do for uh, translational science partnering in terms of what you might want to be doing in the universities. We have expertise in entomology, pathology, pesticides, the use and formulation. We have a number of large data sets and we're not utilising them to their full, but we would very much like to work with the university sector there in getting more value out of the data that we are collecting. And we have these uh, cause uh, expertise in rare disciplines, so if you want expertise in, the on in taxonomy or the ologies, again, there's something very useful you can get from working with the agency. Uh, and finally, we are quite close to government and private sector. We do have that insight into some of the interesting science that needs to be done to address real-world problems. Uh, finally, if you want to find out more about FERRA, there's our, our web address, and I'd be happy to take any questions either now or uh, at lunch. Thank you.